Good evening. Um, my name is Rishad Kasaba. I'm the uh, director of Henry M. Jackson School of International Studies. And I'm very pleased to welcome you to this evening's uh, presentation. I would like to start uh, this evening uh, by acknowledging the presence of some distinguished guests we have with, you, with us. Um, Honorable Consul General uh, Masahiro Omura of the Consulate General of Japan in Seattle is with us. Um, and his staff, we are very pleased to have him. Um, Judy Howard, Divisional Dean of Social Sciences. I would also like to acknowledge the generosity of Mitsubishi Corporation. Um, without them, of course, none of this would have been possible. And in, particu in particular, Mr. Shinichiro Kawazoe, Vice President of Mitsubishi Corporation Americas and General Manager of the Seattle branch, and his staff for their support of Japan studies at the University of Washington. So this is the first of three lectures uh, that we will host uh, this rest of this year uh, under the Mitsubishi uh, uh, support. Uh, the next lecture will be on April 21st. In your programs, there is a full description. Uh, we will host Carol Gluck, historian from Columbia University, who will be giving a talk on memory and war. And on May 28th, we are very pleased that uh, Shinichi Kitaoka, who was supposed to be here earlier but he had to cancel, will come uh, to give a talk on uh, security issues in East, East Asia. And we're looking forward to those presentations and they promise to be very interesting. And we are truly honored and um, indebted to Mitsubishi Corporation for their continuing support of the Jackson School and the University of Washington. <laughs> Um, in the past years, the scholarships that they have given, um, uh, more than $20,000, uh, have supported many students and activities, and this year their support is making this series possible. So we're very pleased uh, to have this cooperation. So please join me now uh, in thanking them once again to Mitsubishi Corporation. <laughs> At this time, I would like to introduce my colleague, Maria Anterdugi, who is a professor of Japan Studies at the Jackson School and also the chair of the University of Washington's Japan Studies program. Thank you, Rashad. Uh, before I introduce our guest tonight, I want to explain the index cards that you received when you came in. If you have any questions for Professor Ito, please write them down on the card. And at the end of the lecture, pass them to the aisles, and we will have students picking them up, and we will use them in the Q&A session, OK? It is my great pleasure and a great honor to introduce Professor Motoshige Ito, one of the world's top experts on the Japanese economy. Dr. Ito is a professor of economics at the University of Tokyo and was dean of that department from 2007 to 2009. He has been the president of the National Institute for Research Advancement, one of Japan's top policy think tanks since 2006. Professor Ito has written many articles in top journals, book chapters, and over 40 books in English and Japanese on a variety of topics related to economics in Japan's economic policy. Let me just mention a few books that have come out just in the last few years. These include What the Economic Crisis Did to the World in 2009, Can Japan's Medical System Change, Disequilibrium Trade Theories, Let's Promote Creative Destruction in the Japanese Economy, and Japan's international competitiveness. He also regularly writes opinion pieces for major newspapers and magazines and is a regular commentator on Japanese TV shows. Professor Ito has been in various positions advising prime ministers, 
and cabinet ministers on economic policy, and he's currently a member of the Council on Economic and Fiscal Policy, which is part of the cabinet office. He has an undergraduate degree from the University of Tokyo and a PhD from the University of Rochester. As many of you know, Japan's economy went into sort of a slow growth period when its land and stock market bubbles burst in 1990. It was bouncing back by the mid-2000s, but then it got hit by the financial crisis in 08 and the Tohoku earthquake in 2011. Well, tonight, Professor Ito is going to be talk about, going to, going to talk about recent efforts to revitalize the economy in a talk titled Abenomics and the Japanese Economy, Prime Minister Abe's New Policies to Boost Japan's Economy. Please join me in welcoming Professor Ito to the University of Washington. Professor Chan Chozugi, uh, Professor Kasaba, uh, Mr. Kawazoe of the Mitsubishi Corporation, and uh, Council General uh, Omura, and distinguished guests and ladies and gentlemen, it was my, my great honor and uh, my pleasure to be here, to come back to Seattle, uh, and to talk about Japanese economy. Um, I just explained before by Professor Anchozogi, it is called Abenomics, uh, just uh, uh, following his uh, name of the Prime Minister, and I'm now heavily involved in the decision making of the uh, macroeconomic policy. I met Prime Minister just uh, about a week ago, and we talked extensively about the tax reform of the Japanese economy. And I want to just uh, uh, bring the, his energy of trying to change the Japanese economy to this place so that uh, we can have a uh, better understanding of the, what is going on now j in Japanese economy. Now, before, let's see. Before speaking about the, uh, the, the current Japanese economy, I would like to just spend a few minutes about the deflation scale. You know, deflation is a phenomena where price is just constantly falling. Not only just price, wage, or nominal income, and so on and so forth. Just red one is just uh, what we call the core, core uh, price index, which means just price is excluding food and energy, which provide you more the uh, reasonable just trend of the price. And the blue one is core inflation rate, which is just exclude, excluding uh, the price of the, uh, the food, but the other product. But anyway, it was just declining from the after Lehman crisis. And also I uh, didn't bring the data before the Lehman crisis. The, we actually experienced the deflation for more than 10 years and Japan is the only industrial country in the world which experienced deflation for, me, for this long period. And uh, one of the very uh, difficult part of the deflation, is it has kind of, kind of feature of the vicious circle, okay? I just write something uh, as an example. So when demand is very stagnant, uh, the market performance is not very good and people become very pessimistic which means just uh, uh, ordinary people just save more rather than spend more, which is also providing another weaker demand. And the corporate sector is the same thing. They don't invest more much because they have very pessimistic uh, prospect in the future. So they rather try to return their borrowing or even save the money. And that just provided just a uh, falling price again. And this is just a very important economic fact that when price is falling, real interest rate is very high. Uh, the definition of real interest rate is ordinary interest rate minus increasing inflation. So even though the inf interest rate in Japan is just about 1% even for long-term government bond, price is falling 1% to 2% every year, which makes investment very difficult. So that is what I wrote in high real interest rate. So it is very difficult to get out of this trap. 
And it is a challenge for Prime Minister Abe uh, how we can get out of the, the uh, deflation. Now, important thing uh, is we are, Japan is not alone, actually. <laughs> I, I don't know whether you have ever heard the term secular stagnation, or meaning kind of a f structural or the long lasting uh, weak demand economic condition, which was originally used by Alvin Hansen, of the Harvard professor, in 1940s. And recently, this uh, secular stagnation become very famous because the Larry Summers of the Harvard uh, just started using this, and there was a lot of uh, debate now whether uh, we are having a secular stagnation in the United States, in Europe, and in Japan. And actually, I was in Davos uh, a month ago, and we had a special session for discussing secular stagnation. So Summers was there, and Ken Long of the Harvard, who was also a former uh, top chief economist at IMF, and other people. But the important thing is Japan is, uh, I'm talking a lot later, but as you know, we had experienced crash of bubble in the beginning of the 1990s, and which made us very difficult. But we almost finished the business of the financial crisis in the beginning of 2000, after a very long distance time of the difficulty. But still, after financial crisis ended, it was more than 10 years that we were in stagnation, in spite of a very stimulating fiscal policy, and in spite of the very low policy interest rate. So there must be something wrong. And we Japanese often say this may be due to aging of population because when your population is aging, people become very pessimistic, or they are not m making invested much. But uh, the other countries uh, has also a very similar uh, experience. The United States uh, was hit by Lebanon crisis, but I think, I personally think the US government and the central bank did a very good job to just stop the spread of the risk but still, it took many, many years for the United States to recover from the crash of a bubble. Why it took so many years? And Europe, you probably know, in spite of the, the very, very strong effort to recover from the fiscal and financial crisis, Europe is now in a kind of very dangerous situation of just uh, getting into the zone of deflations. So, uh, when we are talking with the European economists, they often just ask us about experience of deflation uh, in the past 10 years. And even just before the Lehman crisis, you probably know we had an IT bubble crash in 2000 in the United States and 9-11 in 2001, and that provided us a very uh, gloomy perspective in the future. But fortunately or unfortunately, I don't know, depending on your interpretation, Mr. Greenspan, did a very ambitious, drastic measures. And that actually drove up the economy. But if you look at the data very carefully, also you had experienced the so-called the booming, or I mean bubble, of the stock price and the real estate, but real growth rate was not very high. And even price did not increase very much. So increasing number of the economists start talking about we may be in secular stagnation. But we don't know the reason, maybe because of demographic change, or maybe because of the, some kind of the lack of innovation for some reason, whatever the reason. So the Japan, Japan's experience now is not only very useful for Japan, but also it may be very uh, helpful for other countries to think about the uh, present reality of the industrial nations. Okay, now, uh, the, this is what I said so far, and the, in some respects, the Abenomics, especially the monetary policy of the Abenomics is very similar to what the United States did. So what they call the QE1, QE2, Q3, after the Lehman crisis. So we could find some kind of similarity between the two countries, and we, of course, may have uh, some diff different point about the economic policies. So what is the uh, Abenomics? Uh, as you probably know, the Abenomics uh, has three arrows 
the first allo is expansionary mitoprotease, and second allo is uh, what they call flexible fiscal stimulations, fiscal policy, and third allo is just the growth strategies that promote private investment. So let me first uh, speak about the most important part of the abenomics last year, and it is still going on. That is just uh, very expansionary monetary policies. Maybe I should show first uh, what happened in Japan after Mr. Abe became prime minister. Now, the red one uh, just providing what the economists call the monetary base. Monetary base is how much money Bank of Japan, Central Bank of Japan, just provide money to the market, about the professional market. And there was a very drastic increase after the, uh, the uh, beginning of the 2013. It's very, very drastic. And the, another very important thing uh, is just blue one. This is how much Bank of Japan hold the long-term government bond. You know, uh, if you know the, uh, the operation of central bank, you may know uh, the for central bank to just expand monetary base, what they usually do is buy short-term government bond. Do you know why? Just buying only short-term gov short government bond just make it very explicit there's a separation of fiscal policy and monetary policies. Now, that is the way Bank of Japan did in the past. But one of the very important things that Bank of Japan did this time is they intentionally purchased a lot of long-term government bond. You know why? It shows they can sell it in the near future. It's very important, difficult to sell the long-term government in the future when they have to just shrink the money base. Because if the Bank of Japan sell the long-term government bond they purchased in the past, that means just a very drastic adjustment of the price of the bond, which makes the fiscal policy more difficult. But this is what economists call commitment. Do you know the old story in China? There's a river behind the armies, and the much stronger army is just coming to fight with these weak armies. And now the, the chief of this weak army did was just destroy the bleach so that they can't escape. And this gives a very strong signal to weaker armies that they have to just uh, kill the other army in order to, for them to survive. And this provides a very strong signal to the strong army coming to, the, uh, to this side, I mean, because the, now this is more difficult. This is what economists call commitment. If you take any course on the game theory, you may know. By doing something you can't reverse, you give same signal to the other part that the situation is different. And what Bank of Japan did is commitment. We never go back to deflationary stage because the Bank of Japan just keep buying long-term government bond, which they can sell. And this actually was very, very effective. So commitment may be necessary to get away from the deflations. So this is the uh, typical data, long-term government bond interest rate, blue one in the US and red one in Japan for 10 year maturity government bond, which is the typical uh, economic indicator showing the long-term interest rate. Now, uh, the blue one, as you know, the, there's a kind of a gradual increase. But the important thing is, if you look at the Japanese long-term government bond interest rate, is moving to the level of something like 1% is now to 0.7%, okay? And uh, so there is something very, very uh, strong uh, response of the market. This is a typical response. The other response uh, is stock price. Now, the red one uh, is uh, the stock price, and it was just uh, uh, the major, what we call Nikkei index, so it's, which is very similar to Dow Jones. So it's kind of a composite of the stock price, which is around around 8,000 before the abenomics, uh, the bottom part, just increased to the level of the 16,000. It's almost doubled in a very short period. So this is how effective the market uh, response was to the monetary policies. 
And uh, the, by the way, the blue one was the money base, which I have already shown in the previous uh, slide. The another uh, very uh, good news for us is prices start increasing. This is actually uh, inflation rate, okay? And the, again, the red one uh, is a CPI excluding food, and the blue one is CPI excluding food and energy. But anyway, both provide you the more uh, reliable uh, the idea of a price because energy and the food just move very fluctuation. So we should exclude to see the more basic uh, price indexes. And there was some uh, inflation before Lehman crisis. Uh, but this is only just very short term period. If I had the data before uh, 2007, you will see, you would see the very long period of the deflation, Mimi, minus below zero zone. And then very temporary recovery, but Lehman crisis, just the picture, every, make, make picture everything very different. But now the, suddenly after the, the Mr. Abe just took the office, the price started increasing very constantly. And now I think the uh, CPI is now reaching to the level of something like 1% or maybe more. So price start rising. So my type policy uh, works so far. And this is a uh, growth rate GDP uh, for quarterly data. So the, the point like a 3.7 and then minus 1.7 and then minus 3.1, and this number just provides you the uh, gross quarterly uh, data growth rate. Uh, and again here, the real economic uh, activity just responded very quickly and we have a, a sudden increase in the not only just nominal, but the real growth rate like this. And uh, just uh, this diagram just provided just the uh, composition of growth, but that may not be very important for the present talk, so I just skip. But anyway, so growth rate just adjusted very quickly. And uh, this is the employment data. Please just look at only just the uh, red one. That may be relatively easy. The red one is just uh, providing you the data of the, I'm sorry, the unemployment uh, rate, okay? Uh, which was about 5.5% uh, 5 .5 2009, at the bottom of the economy. But now it's uh, almost 3.7%. Unemployment rate is 3.7%. Do you know what is unemployment rate of the United States? I don't know, but uh, you can probably have much bigger numbers. By the way, unemployment of the Greece is uh, something like 28%, uh, and uh, Italy is 12%. So the unemployment, un unemployment rate of 3.7% is something like a very close to what economists call full employment. So there was a drastic uh, uh, improvement in the employment. So monetary policy is a monetary policy. So financial market or monetary market exchange rate adjust very quickly, but the important thing is other real economic activity is just uh, catching up very drastically. So this may be a very good lesson for other countries when you are facing secular stagnations, the monetary policy may be a very good uh, just menu for the, the beginning of stimulation. Okay. But uh, the now the attention of the market is shifting to the next stage. Because we know the monetary policy and fiscal policy is only just a temporary stimulation. We cannot continue growth by only fiscal matter stimulation. What is very important is how we can just drive the uh, goods circle or cycle of private sector's activity. So we need more investment, consumption, and also maybe export. And the, the third arrow, uh, is the now the attention. I have many visitors actually, by the way, from the United States and from the Europe. Do you know who are they? Investors of venture, uh, the hedge fund, <laughs> for example. They're very much interested in the, what is going on in Japan. And the only question they ask me is a third dollar nowadays. Because they know just the monetary policy and fiscal policy has finished their role, has already just uh, uh, the, uh, the implemented. So they are very much interested in the implementation. Not only just uh, 
uh, investors of the hedge fund, but also many journalists come. And some people are very pessimistic because the third alloy is basically deregulations, opening of the market, or tax reform, and that kind of what economists call supply side policies. Not only for Japan, but for any country, I think the supply side policy is very difficult because you have to just fight against interest group. For example, when the government want to just liberalize the agriculture policy, you probably know we have very strong farmers <laughs> against liberalization. If you try to just uh, the reform the labor market, we have very strong labor unions, which is against the, any change. Or if you want to have a very drastic uh, adjustment or measures to, for example, the, uh, the subsidy of the small and medium-sized companies, we have very uh, good uh, or very strong support for small and medium-sized farm. But if we try to just change the system, we have a lot of resistance by small and medium-sized companies, and so on and so forth. So uh, this is a very difficult thing. So it is often the case that the American investors, the European investors in hedge fund came to my office, and they say they are very pessimistic to that kind of policy change. So I respond by this way. Japan is North Korea, OK? North Korea, which is so-called the, the uh, how do you say, uh, the political system, the fat top person said is followed by other people. But the Japan is democratic countries, so the main player is not the government. Main player is private sector. So I hope we have a good economic policy because that may drive the, uh, the more investment and consumption by private sector. But even without the government policy, I hope the private sector move to do more invest and more uh, the other things. And this is very important for the people to understand the policy. Here I just said demand side and supply side. That is one aspect of that issue. What is important for a while is not supply side, so demand side. Because the supply side, as I said before, labor market reform, or tax reform, or financial reform, or immigration policy, these are very important. But even though we just start implementing this policy, it takes many, many years for the actual economy to respond. But we need now, just this year, next year, is more the expansion of the, say, so demand side may be more important. And this is maybe one very important aspect of the third law of Japan. So again, I say, third law is not just growth strategy. Third law is a growth strategy that promote private investment. Now, there's one very important, one uh, important aspect of the Japanese, uh, sorry. Uh, economy. This is a typical uh, one aspect of the uh, Japanese economy. We had a very difficult experience for 20 years. Economy is very stagnant, and the government debt was accumulating because we have a di diminishing tax revenues and so on and so forth. But there's one thing which is, was very good for Japan. What happened is just balance sheet, balance sheet is improved drastically. I had a very interesting conversation with European people about a year ago in France. And we talked a lot about the European financial crisis. And we explained a lot about just the crash of the government bond and the accumulating government debt and very difficult position of the people in Europe because of very big burden of the mortgage borrowing and the corporate sector has a huge amount of borrowing, and the financial market has a huge amount of uh, non-performing loan. And Japan was in a very similar situation 10 years ago, or maybe 15 years ago. But fortunately, I said to the, my European friend, our government still has a huge amount of debt. So that's a big issue. Well, I'm going to discuss about this issue later. But fortunately, household sectors, corporate sectors, and financial sectors just get rid of the, all of the problem, and now household sector has the largest amount of fiscal financial asset over their income in the world. And corporate sector has no borrowing. Many countries have more than 50% of 
of listed company in Japan do not have any borrowing. And banking sector, one of the problems for them is not no problem alone. One of the problems for them is so many deposits coming to banking sector, but they couldn't find any place to lend because we have very weak investment demand. So this is a typical picture. Now, blue one is the debt of corporate sectors. The amount is in the uh, right hand side. So in the peak, it's about something like a 500 trillion Japanese yen, which is about uh, 5 trillion US dollar. It's the peak of the debt. And now the debt is just declining very, very much. And so that means just corporate sector does not have any more debt. And the red one is just to give you the idea about saving position, which is again just moved from the negative side to positive side, which means just companies are continuing saving up the asset. So, so far, so good. The problem is how we can mobilize this investment. That is the, the, the important thing. I had very good conversation with Mr. Son of the South Bank about one year ago uh, in TV program. Uh, you know, he decided to buy uh, Sprint Nexel, the mobile phone company in the United States, by the amount of the two trillion yen, which is about two 20 billion US dollars, the largest investment by Japanese company in the United States. But the important thing is he borrowed over one, uh, four, three over four of that investment money from bank. So that means he borrowed a huge amount of money, borrowed from bank and make investment. And he came to my TV program to explain this. So the only thing just I want to ask to him is, is this okay for you or for your company? And his answer was very, very excellent. He does. Well, the, we have a, a lot of money. So what is we don't have is not money. What is important is a courageous behavior by the company. And he said he even was very pessimistic in the past, but now he have to move. And this is the kind of, kind of typical thing we want to explain. I have not any comment about the good or bad about the investment. Important thing is the other company uh, should follow a very similar approach because we have a very uh, large amount of money with very low interest rate. And if they start moving, that may be good, very good for the uh, Japanese economy, okay? And so uh, the uh, abenomics uh, about third alloy is how we can just uh, de de stimulate the uh, demand. I'll give you three a most is a, a typical example of this type of the policy. One is just uh, electric reform. We had a very difficult experience of the uh, accident in Fukushima. And after the accident of Fukushima, government finally moved to just reform the electric system. You may know we have a very outdated or the very old fashioned system where 10 companies just monopolize local market and they have no competition between them from Hokkaido to Okinawa and because they have a very strong politically. And the government tried to just change many, many times, but uh, they couldn't. But finally, this accident in Fushima provided some kind of a momentum for reform. So what happen now is two things, important thing. One is what we call unbundling. Unbundling is separation of generation to, uh, from the transfer and transmission. And second is full liberalization of retail market. And both of which provide a huge opportunity of investment for companies. For example, generation. As you probably know, we invested so much in nuclear in the past. Uh, we are just increasing nuclear, which means we didn't invest much about the most sophisticated technology of the gas or coal or oil, because uh, everybody is just looking at nuclear. But when we have a problem in nuclear, and now, as you know, we are shut down, shutting down nuclear, suddenly we found our 
uh, the gas generation is very outdated. In spite of the fact the company like Mitsubishi or Toshiba or Hitachi is now producing the most sophisticated equipment, but we have not invested. So unbundling is providing a, a lot of opportunity for trading companies, gas companies, steel companies, or the energy company like uh, the ExxonMobil or Shell or even Japanese JX to make an investment to the most sophisticated uh, uh, fossil f uh, the energy uh, the technology. That is one thing. The other thing is uh, the retail uh, the uh, liberalization is another very important area uh, because the, there's a lot of opportunity for just entry. You know, one of the largest uh, real estate company, Mitsui, for example, uh, which is very famous for big op the development in the center of Tokyo, uh, they announced to just start producing oil, no, not electricity, just in the middle of Tokyo. This underground uh, generation of the gas, which is providing energy in that region, which is actually very profitable. Because then, by that system, they can not only use most advanced technology, but they can also use heat in addition to electricity to utilize for energy. And that was not that very difficult in the past because of the regulation. So uh, the important thing is the amount of investment involved in this kind of the investment is huge amount. Okay, so this is uh, what the government want to do. We have to invest a lot in the future for us to just change our energy to more uh, realistic position, which means investment maybe in 10 years, 20 years, and 30s. We need a lot of investment for the reform. And what governments should do is to just update, have some investment, not in the future, now. And the investment not by the government, investment by private sector. The Olympic maybe is the other good example. It is going to be held in 2020. So it is not useful if your investment finished in 2023. So 2020 just give us some kind of time limit for the investment. So suddenly many people in private sector start talking what the company is doing by 2020. I had a very interesting conversation with one of the president of the TV or the home electric appliances. As you know, we had a very difficult competition position with the Korean producers in the past because they have very uh, advanced technology in a very rapid time. And but uh, the, this president uh, of the home electric appliances say we may have another chance to fight back. Because of the new generation of the TV is coming, as you probably know, 4K TV or 8K TV, which provided much, much, you know, final picture uh, to the people. Now, in order to be successful in this kind of business, three elements must be included. One is company must provide a good product, of course. And second is just uh, the broadcasting companies provide a good uh, program uh, using this kind of technology. And but the most important thing is people must buy new TV and Olympic may be a very good uh, opportunity. Uh, actually, we had a very, exactly the same experience in 1964 when we had Olympic. And that was a very good opportunity for the, uh, the home electric appliance companies uh, provided that kind of a new uh, product to the market. And uh, the many, many other things, uh, the uh, transportation is now changing a lot in Japan. And we actually did a lot of transformation of the deregulation of the airport, especially Haneda Airport and so forth. So there seems to be a mushrooming of the what we call the low-cost carriers. Japan was very behind the United States and Europe in the sense that we have a very short, small share of low-cost carriers. But suddenly it started moving, okay? so. This provides a lot of opportunity for investment of this kind of transportation business, and not only just transportation, of course, tourism and so on and so forth. So anyway, how we can just uh, agitate the investment related to Olympic timing uh, is another very important uh, private investment. And finally, special zone. This is a very difficult part, but this is very important. Now, 
The special zone, you probably know, we just have a very the short, sh small area for deregulation. And I have to uh, just say, the government strategy to the special zone is changing drastically in the last two years. Previously, special zone was used as a weapon for uh, re de de deregulations. De national deregulation is not very easy. So the government strategy was just pick up some small area uh, to just uh, have a deregulation there. And if it is successful, then they can just spread over the nation. But this time, the what they call large city deregulation special zone is very different. We are not thinking about just spreading uh, to the rest of the world, rest of, rest of the country. Just because Tokyo, Osaka, and maybe two or three other big cities, so that we can just make this part as a kind of a, the driving force for the globalization. So the government is now more serious about just uh, doing a drastic uh, deregulation in certain limited area so that the globalization uh, will just provide us more uh, opportunity to the countries. Let me just talk about this very uh, shortly about the supply side. In spite of the, all the things I said, we still face a very serious problem. The question is, can we continue high growth in the long run? And this is uh, what uh, economists call the potential growth rate, the basic growth rate. And potential growth rate just uh, consists of the increasing input of labor and the increasing input of capital and what economists call the total factor productivity, which is uh, uh, the, uh, how the TFP is a growth rate of the innovation or the more efficient use of the resources. And you can see we have a very uh, drastic uh, decrease in growth rate, and the question is whether we can just expand from now on. And certainly, supply side policy is so important because otherwise we can't do. Some of the increase of the growth rate can be expected. Uh, this is a very complicated in economics. Uh, the, gro the, the total factor of productivity, the growth rate, uh, is often influenced very much by demand sectors. Take a look at the case of the department store. Department store has a building and shopkeepers. And if you have a very small number of customers, productivity is very low. The same building and same shopkeepers, but if you have an increasing number of the customers, then productivity grow up. So what we experienced in Japan in the past 20 years is because of the weakness of the demand, we cannot fully utilize our ca capability of production. So, uh, so for, for a while, I think the expanding demand, which I just mentioned, provide increasing potential growth for a while. But in order for us to continue further, we need uh, the deregulations uh, in labor market, financial market, and uh, the uh, globalization and so forth. This is the challenge for the, the Prime Minister Abe, and this is how investors from the United States and Europe is just looking very carefully and we have to wait and see whether we can just go through more difficult part of the uh, reform. And uh, you probably know we have a very uh, difficult position of the demographic structures. And uh, we have a, I have a two pictures. The upper one is the total population, and lower one is what we call so-called the uh, population from the age of 15 to 64, so-called working populations. And this is decri declining very rapidly. As you probably know, this is not only Japan phenomena, it's a phenomena in Asian countries in general. And this provided us a lot of uh, the difficulty of the increasing potential growth. It is not related, much at, much, not at all with the GDP or per capita, uh, what is maybe most important. But still, I think the gross uh, total amount of GDP is very important. So whether we can just uh, 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 ch change the pattern of population or whether we can just compensate by innovation or other economic total factor productivity, th th this is uh, very challenging. But this is a very long-term issue. I will not be surviving <laughs> maybe 15, 15 years, 50 years. So uh, this is more the long-standing. But anyway, this is a very important thing. 
And uh, so there's a many, many discussion now is going on. Uh, this is the so-called inward direct investment, how much investment is coming from abroad. Not an, as a flow, it's a more cumulative numbers. So UK it has a huge amount of the stock of the investment from abroad, and you can see Japan is the bottom. This is a very unusual phenomenon. Okay, if you look at any data of a foreign direct investment, usually it is what economists call cross whoring or two directionary. So the amount of investment in the United States to the rest of the world is very similar to the amount of investment coming to the United States. It's very similar to trade. You export what you are good at, and you import the product where you don't have a uh, comparative advantage. So difference of you and your trading partner provide is export and import. And uh, foreign direct investment is something which you cannot trade directly. But if you have a very good uh, technology or financial market, then you can make investment to Tokyo, to the business in Tokyo. And so the, the foreign direct investment is very similar to trade. And so for many industrial nations, outward and the inward has a very comparable number. Japan is the only exception. We try to find why, there are many reasons. Maybe we don't speak much, we don't speak good Japanese, good English, just as I am. <laughs> or maybe Japanese community has some problem like uh, if, you have, if you come to Japan, you may have some difficulty of finding medical doctor who speak French English. Or maybe, uh, not now, but uh, in the past, the cost of land in Japan is so expensive, so it's not easy to find a good apartment in a reasonable cost, and so on and so forth. So government is trying to just uh, the, uh, reform so that we can have more investment from abroad, and if we can just increase the foreign direct investment, that may be another source of the increasing uh, productivities. Let me, because I don't have much time, let me just go quickly to the, here, sorry. This is another very important issue, fiscal reform. You, pro you probably know we have a very large amount of the government debt. I may have some data somewhere. No. This may be provided the idea uh, of the, now this red one, just give you the idea is a percentage of government debt over GDP, okay? And uh, our government debt over GDP, according to the statistic is uh, something like uh, 190%. It depends on how you measure it uh, because the government has many different type of debt. So if you just over, uh, evaluate the debt, maybe the numbers are higher, but certainly our debt over GDP ratio is the, the highest among the uh, industrial nations. Just about uh, one year ago, I had a visitor from the Italy. He's a very famous person. Uh, we're supposed to talk about the uh, fiscal reform uh, over the dinner, and uh, he just emphasized again and again Italy's debt over GDP ratio was only 125%, and our debt over GDP is uh, almost 200%, which implicitly he wants to say Italy is much better position than Japan. <laughs> now, my answer was very obvious, but uh, because I want to be diplomatic, I didn't say this, but I wanted <laughs> to say Italy had a problem only by 125%, and we don't have any problem so far. Uh, 200%. So I'm not saying our problem is not serious. I'm, what I'm saying is just the uh, debt issue or the budget issue is much, much complicated. Important thing is, one most important thing is which direction you're moving in the next few years. It's very important. But anyway, we have a very large amount of debt. But in spite of the fact, uh, this is a typical uh, picture you can see. This is what economists call CDS spread some kind of risk uh, evaluation of the bond, and France is the worst. And uh, then Japan and uh, UK, UK, America, and so on forth. But in spite of the fact that we have a huge amount of debt, the market just still look at just the risk for Japanese government bond is very uh, low. And then we have to ask why this is the case. So let me go just go back to the what is the, the, our strategy for fiscal reform? 
Now, what we learned, first of all, is it is almost impossible to uh, make a fiscal reform under deflation. Okay, in the university, I, I taught different thing. In the university, I taught the student, well, it's very simple to make a fiscal reform, just increase tax or cut the expenditure. By that way, you can just uh, de decrease the debt. The problem is whether that is realistic in the real world. If you increase tax rate a lot, you have to just face the increase in unemployment rate and weak demand. And if you slash the expenditure, then maybe old people may face a problem of medical expense and so forth. So the government couldn't do anything from the political viewpoint under deflation. But that means just stopping deflation is a very important starting point for fiscal reform. So this is a typical picture. Uh, the red one just provided you the, uh, the so-called budget deficit over GDP. But by budget deficit, I mean what we call the primary balance budget deficit, which is just forget about borrowing. Just calculate the tax revenue and government expenditure. And that difference is what economists call primary balance. And that is the most important indicator for when you're talking about fiscal. And we have a minus 6.7% uh, deficit just about one year, just before Prime Minister Abe uh, just become a Prime Minister. And actually, we did a very strong commitment in 2010 that we are going to make uh, this deficit by half by the, year, by the year of 2015. And fortunately, this is actually government uh, simulation. In the future, we are going to achieve our target of a shrinking deficit, 50% by the end of the 2015. The reason is very simple, because we moved from deflation to modest inflation, which provides just increasing government tax revenues. And also we decided just to increase the consumption tax rate from 5% to 10%. So the, the fiscal reform so far is very good for a while. And of course the pro problem is another target we are going to have is we are going to have a budget uh, uh, deficit uh, to the zero. That means the budget surplus by the year of 2020. And even though we can just follow the, what we call the growth path, which means just we have a just good uh, result of economics, we still have a problem, something like minus two point percentage of GDP negative. The reason is very simple. We are aging very rapidly. So in spite of the increasing tax revenues, much faster increase of the expenditure of social security. So we need a more drastic policy from 2015, 2020s. And we have to wait and see what we can do. But anyway, this is the, what is the present position fiscal system. And this is the, the debt GDP ratio. And again, the red one is what government is trying to just achieve. And if we can achieve the 3% nominal rate, gross rate and 2% real gross rate, which Mr. Abe just promised to the market, then gradually, I think debt over GDP ratio is falling because so far, gross rate is higher than nominal interest rate. So that's providing bonus for the declining debt. And eventually, uh, when the uh, uh, budget deficit become positive, there's further, but still very slow declining. But this is reality. You cannot suddenly just decline the debt over GDP ratio very in a short period. So we have to follow this approach. And the uh, important thing is the, we have some uh, good news about the, uh, this, for example, medical expense. Uh, you know, Japan is now the highest uh, the aging population, the total number of the uh, all people over the age of 65 divided by total population, uh, we are the highest. But still, our medical expense over GDP is lower than the average of OECD, OECD countries. So we are doing a very good job to just uh, control the medical expense. Maybe we need more strong uh, measures to further uh, control the medical expense. 
but it is actually a challenge we are facing in the, in the future. So, so far, the, what is more important is stop deflation and the expand the government, uh, expand the economic growth and investment, and that maybe provided the further increase in tax revenue, and that provided just uh, the, as the, uh, to just get, reach a target in 2015. But then we have to just start doing uh, preparation for a more aging community in the future and how we can just uh, uh, continue the reform. So I stop here, uh, but uh, I'm just prepared. Uh, I'm glad to just answer to any economic question you may have, which I didn't touch in our presentation. But it's anyway, thank you very much. Thank you very much for your insightful comments. Um, please pass your cards down the, uh, to the aisle and some students will gather them. Um, I have a question to ask. Um, it's about wages. Many experts are concerned about if Japanese wages don't go up. You know, you expect, when you expect inflation, you're supposed to spend. But actually, if your wages aren't going up, you might actually save more than spend. So I wanted to ask you, how important is it for the wages to go up? I know that last year um, Abe asked corporations to raise their wages, and some of them raised the bonuses, but not the base salary. And um, I know this is a big issue uh, in the upcoming labor negotiations, but I was wondering if you could comment on that. I think the wage is a very important uh, economic indicators for any countries, because just the importance of labor uh, as economic resources. And we had a very difficult uh, experience, just price decline, just cause wage decline, which caused another price decline, so-called minus spiral, price wage spiral. So the, in order to just uh, uh, get rid of the deflation and moving to the modest inflation, like 1% or 2%, we need a, the positive spiral of the cycle of the wage and price. And if you look at the data of any countries in the past, there's very good correlation between price and wage. So eventually, Japanese wage is increasing, but the problem is time lag. So price start moving because of the monetary policy. But if wage start moving in two years, it is not good. So one of the very important targets for the government is how we can just uh, speed up the process of the wage increase. If we can just have an uh, increasing wage earlier, that make us just the process of the uh, modest inflation is more reliable. So Japan did a very interesting policy challenge, what we call the government business union discussion forum, which is very similar to what happened in Europe in the past, in the like a kind of Holland and other countries did. And what they discussed is the government just push strong pressure to the industries or business to raise the price to the level of the price increase, uh, to raise the wage to the level of price increase, and also request the labor union to just uh, have some kind of reform of the labor market, which just the business sector is preferring. So uh, there's some kind of a consensus among the three groups, and the, it is very unusual, but uh, the business group had a written form of statement that they are doing their best effort to raise their wages. So I'm sure big companies are going to raise wage this March. March is a very important period. Once every year, there's very serious negotiation between business and labor union. So we will see the result. But uh, my, my hope is just wage increase has a very good influence, not only to the constant increasing of price, but the more important thing is just providing more wage, providing more uh, incentive for the people to spend for consumption. And, uh, and that is actually one of the most important issues for a while, yes. Thank you. Um, many people are concerned about the rise in the consumption tax from April 1st uh, of this year. It's going to go from 5% to 8%. Um, People are concerned when Japan's economy is still fragile. Why has Mr. Abe decided to do that? 
do you think this will work? Okay. The second part of the question, Mr. Abe didn't decide to raise the consumption tax. I mean, the, <laughs> the former, uh, the, the Prime Minister Noda, uh, had a very ambitious consensus with the opposing party to just uh, do the consumption tax increase. And actually, uh, Mr. Abe is, in a sense, of a free rider uh, to this opportunity. So it's a kind of series of discussion. But Mr. Abe was very lucky that uh, he didn't have to spend much political uh, resources to just uh, increasing the consumption tax. Uh, so I think uh, that is the question, answer to the second question. But the first one is very complicated. Do you know the consumption tax rate of Sweden or Denmark? 25%. And consumption tax of the Germany, maybe 19 to 20, I guess. And this economy is much better than Japanese economy, both in terms of the per capita GDP or even growth rate. So higher consumption tax rate does not imply bad economic performance. So the, the only problem is just adjustment. When we just raise consumption tax rate from 5 to 8%, there may be some short-term uh, bad uh, repercussion, but we have to, anyway, go through it. And I had a very careful study about the uh, European experience of the economic response to the increasing tax. And usually, depending on which country, but usually it took only three months before the demand started growing. So we have to just uh, be very patient for April, May, and June, and there's going to be very good uh, July <laughs> economic expansion. But we have to wait see. So this is uh, kind of a suggestion. And also, government did a lot of uh, uh, special policy uh, to just smooth the demand, like housing market. It's a typical thing where we can have a rush of the housing investment before the tax increase, and then going down the tax investment. But government did a very smart. They provide much better tax deduction for mortgage after increase of a consumption tax. So smart people just recognize it is better to buy a house after tax increase rather than before tax increase because they can just enjoy more, I mean, strong the uh, mortgage tax deduction. But anyway, we have to wait and see. Yeah. Thank you. This is a difficult one. If you could wish for one element to change in the Japanese economy to unlock growth, what element would you wish to see. Sorry about the question. Yeah. No. Uh, <laughs> the, personally, the, I think the most important reform in Japan for the growth, uh, also it is very difficult, is labor market reform. In many respects, uh, we have a very strong so-called lifetime employment system, which means just uh, the, when you have a member of the big companies, you are employed and to retire, and uh, you are very safe. This w functioned very well in the past, but now it's a very big uh, barriers to the more flexible labor market adjustment. So labor market uh, digital reform may provide a much better flexible adjustment. And also the more important thing is just female workers. The Japan is just notorious. Uh, and so, so once I often say we are very uh, potentially very high growth because we are not using effectively the 50% of our population. <laughs> and often they are much more uh, able. I know my students, female students, uh, often do much better than male students. That doesn't mean male students are not bad. They are good. <laughs> but the female students are much, much better. <laughs> so, uh, so that is very important. And Mr. Abe is very serious uh, how we can just mobilize labor. And the third labor reform is just the foreign workers to Japan. Now, immigration is a very difficult issue, so we have to spend a long time to discuss seriously, and eventually maybe we may have a decision making to uh, accept some important uh, immigration. But more urgent thing is how we can just attract more so-called guest workers, such as the uh, old people care. Just the other day, I went to Taiwan and visited my friend's place, and he has an old grandfather whose age is 85, I found just Filipinos nurse just with him. And I was just told 
if you have any person over the age of 80 in your house, or if you have more than three children in Taiwan, they can automatically allow to just uh, employ Filipino or Indonesia, wherever they can. And this costs only 50,000 yen per month, which means about $500 a month. And our Japanese people cannot just enjoy that kind of system. So the many, many very able people is now absorbed by just the overburden of the old people care. So this is actually the type of thing, uh, labor reform. And labor re if we can do the labor reform, we can just much fully utilize the human resources more effectively. Okay. You talked a little bit about immigration policy, but actually several of the questions here are about that. Could you talk a little bit more about how realistic is it to actually think that Japan will bring in the numbers of foreigners needed yeah. to actually make yeah. a difference? Now, there's some misunderstanding. Suppose you have a very ambitious, say, academia, for example, who may not be uh, well-known, just starting academia. Which do you think is easier for this person to have a immigration visa to the United States or Japan? And probably it's much easier for him to, be, to have a visa in Japan uh, if he can find a job in Japan. So officially, our immigration restriction is, is not very strong. But unfortunately, <laughs> we don't have a people coming to Japan. So uh, that is uh, actually the, the, my, my, is something about so-called the uh, skilled person. The story is very different about unskilled people who come to the country and do a kind of very dirty job and sometimes to just uh, disappears from the tax authority and so forth. But as, as long as just the skill job is concerned, uh, our immigration policy so far is very open, but unfortunately, uh, just the, the immigration restriction is not the only barriers for the overseas people to come. So we have to be more strategic to just have more people coming to Japan. So one strategy we are now trying to uh, uh, encourage is we are opening widening up the port of entry in the student study in abroad is the, the best port of entry to the countries. So we try to increase the overseas students coming to Japan. And uh, these people often just stay in Japan or they st start learning Japanese and doing a business or uh, the, uh, the job uh, just uh, even in Asia using Japanese. So that is one strategy. And second strategy is that trying to just uh, promote more the skilled people coming. So we have to just uh, expand the definition of skilled people. Professor is all skilled people. Engineer is skilled people. But we try to make, for example, all the care, all the person care workers as a skilled people so that we can have more opportunity. Even agriculture uh, workers, if they have ambitions to become uh, professional farmers in the future, say in China or in Thailand, then we can just count them as a kind of potential skilled people for, that, for them to come to Japan. So we try to be uh, strategic, not m maybe major change in the, the policy, but uh, more software, I think. Related to that, is, is there any policy that you could put in place in Japan to encourage people to have more children? So again, it's this labor market problem, uh, aging society, declining population. That is the <laughs> big question. This is not only Japan question, that is the Asia as a whole. We have a semi facing a very similar problem. And so uh, there's no simple answer probably. So we have to just find out what is just uh, breaking through policies. Uh, so one thing is just we probably provide more support to working women uh, to be able to the, uh, them to just uh, have children and have a work. And there must be a lot of re-education of the, the husband like me <laughs> to just support. I'm maybe too old you know, to change, but uh, younger generation me more education. And also, I think the government is seriously thinking about providing more subsidy to additional babies. I, I, I know the France was very successful to provide a huge amount of subsidy for the third babies, and by that way they can do. 
And uh, I don't know, the, I'm not the expert on this issue, but uh, that is one of the most important issues for Japan. So we have to uh, do everything we can do. And also a very important thing we did actually, was social security in Japan was uh, the medical expense and uh, pension and all the people care in the past. But uh, two years ago, government intentionally introduced the fourth category of social security. That is the how we can take care of baby and the young, young children and how we can take care of the family which is raising the babies. And the government do some small effort to shift the money from the old people to baby. I'm, I'm sorry for those people, but uh, by that way, by changing the fiscal uh, balance more to the support for the young people, we may hopefully to have more results for the people to decide more having more baby. Thank you. This is another tough one. Um, recent data on economic growth in Japan in the fourth quarter showed that it was less than expected. Uh, the stock market is up, the yen is weaker, inflation is up, but how long should we wait to see if Abe's policies lead to sustainable economic growth? And what happens if Abe's policies do not lead to higher <laughs> economic growth? <laughs> it's a tough question. Now, you, if you know the economy very well, the economy is something like this, okay? So if you grow a lot, say, in the first quarter of the year, then it becomes relatively more difficult to grow further in the next month. And what happened is we maybe grew too much from the uh, January last year to the September. So there's some kind of uh, the uh, too much expansion, so the, we have a very small amount of the, the growth. So we are not very pessimistic. What is important is not just quarterly data. What is important is annual data. So this is going to be trend of growth. The second reason why our growth rate in the last quarter is very weak is because of Asia. So the one of the very big risk for Japan is just the uh, economy is not just decided by domestic factors, by global factors. And one of the problems now our global economy is emerging economy. China, Korea, not Korea, but China, and uh, Thailand, Indonesia, and so forth. They are facing some problem uh, the, because they maybe grow too much. So I hope uh, we are not getting much uh, additional uh, negative influence from the slow growth of the, uh, the emerging economy, but we must wait and see. And uh, the thirdly, uh, the uh, although this is a technical issue, but I want to say in order for monetary policy to have an effect on the real economy, we do have a so-called time lag, one or two years. For example, I mentioned our exchange rate, say US dollar, Japanese yen exchange rate, just uh, depreciated from the level of 80 yen per dollar to 100 yen per dollar, which has a very strong uh, influence on our exporting sector. But actual export will expand maybe in one year or in two years. Because if you just think of any com companies trying to do business abroad, in order to export expansion, they have to adjust their price in their exporting country, and they have to adjust their production capability in domestic country, and it takes about one or two years for them to just make a drastic change. So I think uh, what I talk today, economics, especially monetary policy, also, financial side responded very quickly, but the real economy needs some time. So I hope we will see the uh, influence on real economy maybe uh, from the latter part of this year. Okay. What do you think could increase foreign direct investment in Japan? Okay. Now, uh, many things we have to do. So the the special zone is one typical idea. I had once uh, had a very good uh, conversation with the British, uh, the banking person who is uh, in a very high ranking in the global financial company in Hong Kong. He once tried to just ask the, his American 
colleague in Hong Kong uh, to shift to Japan to do their branch business in Japan. And that American person said, please don't. Please don't send me to Japan because it is a nightmare. And what he said is because when he comes to Japan, income tax rate is very high. And if he, he, he come to Japan, he, cannot ha he may have a difficulty of finding Filipinos to, for their uh, housing work help. Or he may be, have a difficulty of the finding the good doctors, American doctors, who can just uh, provide medical service to the American resident in, the, in Tokyo. It may be over uh, exaggerated. So what we are doing is just to change only a small portion of Tokyo which is much, much more friendly for the international business people to come to them. And so I think the important thing is uh, the major part of the overseas investment to, come to Japan will not come to local prefecture. They are coming to J Tokyo, Osaka. So changing special zone is very important thing. That's one thing. And as I said in the beginning of my speech, we are now discussing very serious talk of corporate tax rate deduction. Do you know what is the corporate tax rate of Japan in the United States? about 37 or 38%. Maybe not in Washington state, but in New York. We are just two exceptional outliers, <laughs> okay? All other countries in Europe, Australia, Canada, or even Asian countries, just uh, in decrease the corporate tax rate to the level of 25%. So if overseas companies are coming to, say, uh, Thailand or Germany, they enjoy very tax low tax rate. But if they come to New York, I don't know about Washington, but if they come to New York or Tokyo, they have to pay a large amount of tax. So the government is now very serious uh, to just lower the corporate tax rate so that we can just have more incentive for overseas company to come. And so maybe we have many more things we have to do. But the important thing is just the present government just started a special uh, project by certain major uh, ministers to discuss the very immediate action to the increasing uh, the inward direct investment coming to Japan. Okay. Could you talk about nuclear power in Japan? Abe has the policy of restarting Japan's nuclear power plants. Uh, how does that impact the economy if he is not able to restart those uh, plants? Uh, as you probably know, that is very sensitive issues. So even prime minister can just do everything, decision making by him. So what, so far, what happened is just uh, uh, we are still cannot just have a consensus among the uh, politics and the people. And what Mr. Abe is doing, just wait and see whether he can move or not. And the important thing is we established the new de de the regulation committees. Most of the members consist of scientists and uh, specialists to just check the reliability or safety of each individual nuclear plant. And if this uh, regulation committee say no, even prime minister cannot just uh, initiate the starting the nuclear. But at the same time, you probably know, uh, because we are now stopping all nuclear, we have about more than 40 nuclear reactors in Japan. The all just uh, stop now. So, which means we are forced to just uh, expand the use of the fuel gas generation. And unfortunately, as I said before, some of the fuel uh, generator is like 50 years old, <laughs> 60 years old, and shouldn't have used, but because we have to use. So uh, that means just we are now importing huge amount of gas from the rest of the world. So uh, in the midterm, we can just uh, the uh, respond to this situation by shifting old fashioned gas generation to the more advanced generators, but it takes, takes some time. And the nuclear uh, issue is still a big problem. And uh, uh, probably industry, uh, especially the heavy industry, is a user of the electricity, is more in favor of restarting the nuclear. But there are quite a large number of people who are very uh, careful about this. So uh, I'm not expert on this, but uh, we still wait and see how uh, the, the Japanese people become a kind of a consensus about going or not going to nuclear. And probably uh, the political people, even prime minister, just wait and see where 
the discussion is going. That is my understanding, but those are not expert on this issue. This is a little bit uh, off topic, but I think a very interesting question. Um, education is an engine for change, and this person is suggesting the lack of English competency is hurting Japan in business uh, in the world, and asks, any suggestions for substantive change in English language competency uh, of future leaders and <laughs> Japanese people in general? Well, I need your advice anyway, <laughs> how we can just uh, improve the, uh, the language capability. Well, the government uh, tried to do something, several things. One is they just start the English education from the elementary school uh, and so that the young people or actual kids have more access to the English. And second thing is the government tried to send the increasing number of the young students abroad for longer education or shortest education. Anyway, if they have uh, access to the education in the United States and Europe, and if they have an opportunity to just uh, participate in the class in English, that may just provide more uh, influence. And third, this is very important. Some company start English as a formal language of their companies, and the increasing number of the company is actually uh, mandated, I mean forced the application, app uh, applying uh, young people to be able to show their English capability. So now young people are more, more, uh, I think, uh, sensitive to this kind of environment. So even in my university, I occasionally just uh, have a session with my students, English only discussions. And maybe 10 years ago or 20 years ago, uh, only 50% or, or maybe 60% of students can have a with active discussion, and some remaining people have the difficulty of speaking in Japanese, in especially in the very uh, active debate or discussion. But nowadays, that share of uh, non-English speaking students become is very small, and so the young people is maybe very responsive uh, to change. So I hope eventually we can have much better uh, capability of using English. But uh, I'm not expert on education, so this is what I can answer. Okay. Thank you. Um, what do you think of TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement um, that the U.S. and Japan uh, and other nations are negotiating? You know, I was a uh, chairman of uh, the consortium to promote the TPP. So I was always, always criticized of farmers <laughs> in the past. But finally, uh, Mr. Abe decided to participate in TPP. So there's no law that the academia like me can do anything. So I'm not now involved in TPP. Now, the main thing that I have to say to TPP, you have to be uh, the, the, you have to know what happened in the world, you know. Japan is negotiating TPP with the United States and other Asian Pacific countries. But at the same time, we are negotiating free trade agreement with EU, okay? And also we are negotiating what we call RCEP. Uh, RCEP is the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership or something, which is ASEAN plus China, Japan, Korea, Australia, but unfortunately excluding the United States. And the United States is uh, now working on TPP and also working with the FTA with the EU. And EU, you can naturally just imagine is negotiating the free trade agreement with Japan and the United States, and they did uh, they finished a job with Canada, and also they are doing some other negotiation. So this is a kind of trend of the world. Fortunately or unfortunately, 60 years ago, maybe 1945 or 1950s, the world is moving into what we call the GATT WTO system, where multilateral negotiation is the center of the global negotiation. But fortunately or unfortunately, I don't know. But anyway, this momentum is just uh, becoming weaker for some reason. So about 20 years ago, maybe the United States just started NAFTA. And we had a uh, first negotiation with FTA with Singapore about thir 13 years ago. So in the beginning, that only more local or bilateral or maybe among three countries negotiation. But now, expansion of a negotiation uh, in a regional basis. 
An important thing is many important non-tariff issue is discussed here, like uh, pro intellectual properties or investment policies or even competition policies and so on and so forth. So Japan has to participate and I hope the United States also participate so that the, we can be in the insider of the negotiation. Now, TPP is a very difficult thing because we have a very difficult political uh, voice of farmers and also the United States has also other political issues. So the negotiation is over negotiation. But if I look at just uh, the, our negotiation TPP from viewpoint of Japan, but the most important thing is Mr. Abe, Prime Minister Abe, make a decision to participate in TPP negotiation last February. And it was surprised everybody because we thought he will wait until the upper house election in July because the, uh, if he just uh, announced he's going to TPP, he may lose a vote in the upper house. But he did, actually, in February. And the reason is very simple, because he think economic uh, the, the vitalization is the most important issue for him. And he cannot just uh, finish the job without doing uh, globalization. And without TPP participation, it's almost impossible to imagine Japan globalize. So TPP itself is important. But the more important thing is Japan decided to participate in TPP and as FDA, and that is a, just provided the idea how mindset of the government is changing fr from the uh, inward looking at to more the open uh, economic policies. Okay, just one one last question. Could you talk a little bit more about the third arrow? Um, why was Abe so late to actually come up with specific? policies, um, and what do you think are the most likely to succeed quickly, uh, policies that are most likely to succeed quickly of the third arrow? Yeah. Well, first I have to say, actually, Mr. Abe is much, much quicker than previous prime minister to implement the <laughs> growth strategies. Look at, the, for example, the rice policies. We, call. we have, a, you know, we have a notorious policy to just ask farmers to decrease the production of rice. It's typical cartel. But that was allowed in Japanese market in order to just raise price for ran, a price of rice. But finally, you know, finally the government just uh, made a position of the decision making just to re abandon rice production regulation. It's surprising. So now if you go to the uh, farming area, everybody's now talking and changing agriculture market. TPP. Uh, previous form Prime Minister, Mr. Noda and Mr. Khan, the, these people also mentioned they're very eager to participate in TPP, but they couldn't because they cannot just uh, push back the pressure from the, the people, from the agriculture. So Mr. Abe did the TPP negotiation. And the corporate tax reduction issues, which I just mentioned, which is taboo in Japan, because the, we have a very good or bad tradition of uh, some kind of socialist viewpoint. And there are many people say increasing consumption tax rate and decreasing corporate tax means just giving more tax value to the corporate sector and give, getting more tax revenue from the people. But this is nonsense from an economic viewpoint because consumption tax is actually value added tax, which means just get tax from everybody, producers, consumers, and the corporate tax uh, deduction just probably benefits people because corporation is the origin of innovation, corporation is the origin of the uh, employment, and the corporation is the origin of the growth. So if you are very uh, sophisticated in economic uh, thinking, uh, the, it is natural for the corporate tax to deduction and corporate tax to increase. And that is what happened in most countries except in Japan and the United States. You go. Other countries just increase the consumption tax and decrease the cost of tax so that the taxes become flat. But that was taboo in the past. That's Mr. Abe did. Many, many other things, medical. Do you know we have a very good system of 100% uh, uh, insurance for the medical services. But sometimes it is going too far 
That means because we are protected by very good insurance, suppose you have a very good new way of killing cancer in the United States with new technology. And if it is not in the risk of our medical insurance program, and if but uh, the patient want to use the American technique in Japan, then he's 100% excluded from national insurance. It's very unreasonable. So there are many people who are just raising voice against this, but uh, our doctors' association is very stubborn to just change the system. But finally, finally, the government just was very successful to just change. We still keep the, the very good insurance system. But if we try to just introduce the, say, the best practice uh, which is just coming in these days to Japan, the patient allowed to just uh, combine them. Not all, it's still the process is moving. So the, we Japanese just uh, recognize the speed of change is very quickly, but that may be different from the viewpoint from the other part. Now in Davos, uh, I was a session and some American very famous economists just uh, uh, said, we American, he said, American person said, the Japanese third law is very weak. But he said, we American, he said, even don't have aloe, or even don't have darts. <laughs> well, no, this is not the United States, only not many countries. Uh, so what I want to say is deregulation reform is a very difficult thing. So you shouldn't imagine that can be achieved only by very strong prime minister or president for a very short period. Even just, I, I think, the medical reform in your country has a lot of difficulty just uh, moving in very quickly. So yes, the sooner the, res the result is better, but uh, still, I think the third law is the most difficult part of the reform. But I hope the United States will have a law at the same time. Uh, we learned a lot from your reform in the past, so uh, we just uh, have a more, uh, just less from your experience for the reform. Well, and we all hope Abe is very, very successful. So thank you. Thank, thank you. you.